Imagine yourself looking back to today from 100 years in the future, from a world whose fate is now being determined. You watched as the leadership of the world lied, played tricks and games, found all kinds of ways to amuse themselves as they welcomed their own self-destruction. You saw masses of people demanding a right to live, others mourning the loss of a loved one who needlessly died. You watched as a once sovereign nation was taken over by hordes of organized crime as gunpoint forced farmers to uproot their crops and replace them with a different kind. And as groups of nations committed themselves not to collaboration for mutual benefit, but rather to a never-ending cycle of war, suffering, and death. As the entirety of humanity was gripped by the dynamic of a failed and destructive system, as the world descended deeper and deeper into hell, where were you? Perhaps in the midst of the insanity of this current world system, there are some who desire to save humanity from hell, who want a solution to the current crisis. But the folly lies in the inability of most in society to recognize that this problem today could never be solved by manipulating interactions within the system. The system itself is the problem. Economist Lyndon LaRouche for decades has been organizing the global community around his unique understanding of the science of physical economy. At the 7th Annual International Rotus Forum, he presented his solution to the current crisis, a solution which would entail four powers, the United States, Russia, China, and India, working together for a new international credit system to replace this imperialist system currently on its last legs. Following LaRouche's presentation, the nations of Russia and China recognizing that none of the current solutions by governments could change the fate of the system, in an unprecedented turn of events, broke from the current world dynamic and took the first crucial steps toward implementing an international credit system. Rather than more monetary scheming, the two powers turned the U.S. dollar debt owed to China into credit for investment into valuable infrastructural and economic projects in the Far East. Similar negotiations are now being conducted with India. But one crucial element is still missing, the United States. The actions of Russia, China, and India demonstrate the direction that the international community is willing and eager to go. Now the only question to ask is, is the United States finally ready to take the necessary steps to join and lead the four powers and overthrow the entire international monetary system? In 2004, Nigeria, one of the many third world countries who has long suffered from effects of diseases such as polio, a disease which has been eliminated in most other parts of the world, resumed polio vaccinations following a year-long hiatus due to the government's fears that the vaccine would be used to sterilize Africans or infect them with the HIV virus. Meanwhile, polio outbreaks across Nigeria had spread into West Africa, Chad, Ghana, Burkina Faso, even reaching as far as Indonesia. However, even after vaccinations were resumed, outbreaks suspiciously continued to increase. In 2007, following a devastating epidemic of polio, 
which left 69 children paralyzed and hundreds more infected, WHO officials discovered that it was the vaccine itself which had caused the epidemic of polio in the first place. Officials and policy makers were baffled as year upon year new outbreaks of polio began from either particularly strong or mutated strains of the polio vaccine. But there was nothing wrong with the vaccine, and surely the policy of vaccination was not the problem. So what was? How could such a good economic policy backfire? Ask yourself this. Would the outcome have been different if the population had been receiving the proper nutrition from vitamin-rich foods that were grown by a thriving agricultural sector? If sanitation was at the highest standards and clean water was accessible? or if the overall health care infrastructure, including state-of-the-art medical facilities, were in place. Under these conditions, a routine vaccination for polio would have been successful. Indeed, the same vaccine in a more developed nation functioned as intended and protected the population against polio. How is it that the same vaccine, applied with the same intended effects, yielded diametrically opposed results. In the known history of our planet's cultures, there are only two important conceptions of social organization, that of a nation-state and an empire. For the last 3,000 years, humanity has been under the domination and rule of an empire, an imperial system. The only exception to this has been the United States of America, the only truly sovereign nation-state in known history. The common problem frequently made when seeking to define the differences between these two forms is to assume some kind of Cartesian interpersonal relationship between them, rather than to view them from the standpoint of dynamics. There is a governing set of axioms, beliefs, and physical conditions that bound any economic process. It is these boundary conditions which determine the interactions within the system. We must look at this problem from the standpoint of what Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz termed the principle of dynamics, or what the Russian biogeochemist Vladimir Konatsky referred to as the Ramanian conception of phase spaces, a conception which is at the heart of the discoveries and contributions made by Lyndon LaRouche in the field of economic science. Vernatsky hypothesized that there were at least three independent but interacting phase spaces acting on our planet. The abiotic, or non-living domain, the biotic, the domain of life and its byproducts, and the noetic, the domain of human cognitive activity. There are many implications to Vernatsky's discovery, but for our present purposes, we will focus in on the most significant. Of these three phase spaces, the noetic, the realm of human cognition, is the most powerful and governs the activities of both the living and non-living aspects of our planet and solar system. As Vernatsky and LaRouche have pointed out, the noosphere is the strongest geological force within the universe as humanity's breakthroughs on the atomic level in nuclear fission and fusion imply. These discoveries have allowed us to synthesize new resources, creating vast amounts of new elements not formerly available to us. Human creative activity changes the composition of the biosphere, taking elements concentrated by living processes and using them within an economy to improve the standard of living and productivity of society as a whole. But more importantly, the recent development of interplanetary spaceflight shows that the influence of human cognition is manifesting itself in regions of our solar system never before touched by humankind, thus demonstrating that the noosphere, the domain of human cognition, is not only a cosmic phenomena, but a developing anti-entropic force within the universe. Now the question is, what type of economy or economic phase space coheres with this Vernatskian conception of man? 
and what are the consequences of failing to organize an economy around this conception. Following Franklin Roosevelt's death, the U.S. adopted the imperial model of globalization as economic policy. With these changes, the internal dynamics that had previously characterized, for example, the way in which goods were produced and distributed, services were rendered, and health care was provided, all changed. Under this system, U.S. production and industries were transported away from a society in which a healthy population was not only equipped with the educational and physical means to make contributions to their society, but they also had the skill level required to innovate and make new discoveries that would increase the overall productivity of their economy, augmenting the living standards of their people, and transforming man's relationship to the universe. Instead, in the name of free trade, productive industries were shipped to places where an uneducated labor force, with no productive capability, became the cheap labor, which lowered the price of goods that were shipped back to developed nations. Our textile plants, our parts manufacturers were shipped off to China and India, our agricultural production to South America. But the cheap price of goods did not simply come from the low wages paid to these workers. It came from the fact that no investment was made into building the basic economic infrastructure necessary for these nations to develop. Expenses such as electricity, clean running water, health or air conditioning are not a concern where there are no power lines, irrigation systems, or housing developments. When you clean with, drink from, and defecate in the same water source. Sure, healthcare is a concern, but without medical facilities constructed by competent engineers and filled with doctors graduated from top universities, what can be done about it? In such conditions, it is virtually impossible for someone to discover a fundamental principle that contributes to society let alone have that discovery be propagated as an increase in technology or living standards. Clearly, that wasn't the intention built into the design of this system. Just look at the horrendous conditions of physical existence, the demoralization and ignorance, the smallness and pessimism that such conditions inevitably produce. Could even a natural right, such as basic survival, what we refer to in our Constitution as the right to life have been considered in this imperial system? Recent events in our own country beg the question. The desire to find ever new cheaper production in the name of free trade, which leads us to seek markets with the lowest possible standard of living, is a never-ending vicious cycle known today as globalization. We've been only interested in getting the lowest price for our goods, while simultaneously lowering the net productive output of the world as a whole, which is ultimately a result of the devaluation of human life. Indeed, the cost of these goods is cheaper. But what exactly is the price? The imperial system seeks to denigrate the value of a human being to nothing more than brute labor. But as the point has been emphasized, the principle which places human beings above the animals, as Vernosky points to the principal distinction of the biosphere from the noosphere, is the most significant function of society's progressive development of its basic economic infrastructure. And this function is of the same class as any discovered scientific principle. For example, take John F. Kennedy's launched U.S. space program. When most people think about the benefits of the space program, they immediately assume that you're talking about money. We've all heard that for every penny put into the program, 50 cents were returned. While that may be true, the real value was not in the profit made, but more importantly, in the worth of the effects of the achievements and discoveries produced by that mission.
Observing the Earth from space has given farmers the tools with which to evaluate the health of crops by determining infestation of pests, water stress, efficiency of fertilizers, and other factors. Threats to crops can be determined months before they would be visible from the ground, and action taken in time to avoid large-scale loss of food. In the 1970s, the Mexican and United States governments used Landsat satellite technology to detect and eradicate drug crops in South America. Medical technologies that have benefited from or depended upon NASA-funded research and development include fluid flow studies for the artificial heart, miniaturized implantable insulin delivery systems for diabetics, remote monitoring of vital signs in intensive care units, rechargeable cardiac pacemakers, astronaut cool suit treatment for multiple sclerosis patients, implantable heart defibrillators, diagnostic tools and technologies, and thousands of other capabilities which have saved lives, improved the productivity of victims of many ailments, and helped prevent disease. Many ideas for quantitative and qualitative improvements in energy technologies were initiated to enable the production of electricity under the constraints imposed by spaceflight and the space environment. Quantitative improvements included the development of compact, high-temperature nuclear fuel arrays for second-generation nuclear fission power plants. Qualitative breakthroughs centered around direct conversion techniques, such as applications of magnetohydrodynamics and new energy production methods, notably nuclear fusion. Industrial processes of every type have been pushed ahead through the use of new materials, Computer control, non-destructive testing techniques, quality control methods, and thousands of individual innovations that were required in order to manufacture spacecraft that could withstand the space environment and support both men and machines. During the 1960s, NASA provided the resources for thousands of college and graduate level students to pursue studies in science and engineering. Grants went to educational institutions to upgrade facilities, to faculty to support their research, and to students to encourage them to study the sciences. The peak year for NASA funding was in 1965. The peak year for doctorates granted in the physical sciences and in engineering was in 1971. Not because NASA paid for all these degrees, but because there was a great interest in joining the space enterprise. It was the discovery of the universal principle of gravitation by Johannes Kepler hundreds of years earlier which created the potential for the space program. Just as the principle of universal gravitation contains the solar system as a process, so the principled advances in the organization of that aspect of basic economic infrastructure affecting production, advances that can only be made by human minds, are the subsuming dynamic which prompt what are effectively qualitative as also quantitative improvements in those productive powers of labor situated in the relevant economic phase space. The supply of the benefit secured is not confined to the action of the individual person or enterprise. It acts through changes in the environment of production and daily existence of members of society which are affected not at the point of production, but rather in the environment or dynamic of production. The world right now is faced with a moral decision. Either we can choose to reject the centuries-long economic model that has currently led this planet to the brink of a dark age, or we can implement a new system based on international cooperation of sovereign cultures that recognizes the unique role of man as a cosmic force within the universe. If we continue to cling to this imperial system, the entropic disintegration inherent to this economic phase space is inevitable. Humanity must make the breakthrough, destroy this system, and create a new dynamic within society. LaRouche's four power solution to implement the international credit system based on this principle can become the new phase space we live in. Russia and China are moving in the direction of LaRouche's solution. But without the leadership of the United States 
and the constitutional powers inherent therein, any effort at an international reform of the current economic system will not succeed. Return again to that place in time 100 years from now. But this time, not as a spectator, watching as the dynamics of the current system plunge humanity into a dark age. Instead, put yourself on the stage of history and recognize your role as a cognitive force within the universe. In our society today, we have close to 7 billion people, but nearly a third are in utter poverty. We have hundreds of nations and even greater numbers of governments and types of governments, but barely any have the power to sustain their own populations. We have committed thousands of soldiers and over 40 years to countless wars in the Middle East but victory is as far away and as intangible as when we first began. We have circulated trillions of dollars to pay a false debt, which has only cheapened our dollars faster than we can even print them. We have elected thousands of officials, hundreds of congressmen, and filled multitudes of other positions to make this nation better. But their politics has only driven us further towards a breakdown crisis such as we have never seen before. If such a force, such great numbers, don't have the capability to change the reality guiding this world today, then what does? What is shaping the reality we live in today? On May 29, 1919, on an island in Principe, South Africa, following a huge thunderstorm which threatened to jeopardize the whole trip, the sky gently cleared, greeting the earth once again with its morning sun. A timely occurrence indeed, if the experiment was to be successful. Everything was in place. Earlier, the expedition had taken photographs of the nighttime sky, and now those lay in preparation, waiting for the final steps of the experiment to be completed. With only a few minutes to go, the equipment was checked, the cartridges were put into position, and the lens pointed to the proper part of the sky. In the middle of Africa, halfway across the world, history was to be made. On that day, the moon slowly covered the sun, forming a solar eclipse. All of the solar light was temporarily blocked out, exposing the breathtaking view of the stars. For five minutes, while the sun was eclipsed, the expedition, led by Sir Arthur Eddington, photographed the eclipse and the surrounding stars in the zodiac, which are otherwise invisible during the day. Earlier, Photographs were taken of the location of those same stars, but this time at night, without the presence of the sun. Weeks later, the scientific body of Cambridge University, which had sponsored the expedition, 
gathered to view the results. No less than a new theory of gravitation was being tested. If the two pictures were identical, it would mean that the light emanating from the stars, traveling through a gravitational space, were unaffected by the presence of the sun. After all, if the space through which the starlight moved had an absolute existence independent of objects in it, and if the time during which the starlight propagated consisted of a continuous series of equal intervals, then we would not expect the starlight to travel differently or appear to us in a different location in the sky if the only thing that's changed is the relative position of the sun. Is the space-time of the universe absolute, fixed, and independent? Or does it have a dynamic, ever-changing, developing character? Is there a space independent of objects within it? Is there a time independent of the events which occur in time? Upon overlaying the two transparent photographs, one atop the other, a gap appeared between the positions of the same stars on the photographs, meaning that the curvature of the space which light was traveling through, or rather, the gravitational field that the light was traveling through, was changed by the sun's effect on that field. The presence of the sun itself changed and indeed was part of the space-time the light was traveling through. When we look at something like gravity, which is the principle that holds in place and organizes our solar system, we are not viewing a phenomena within empty space. You are not seeing a gravitational field within a box called absolute space and time. Rather, the shape of the phenomena, the principle itself, in this case, the principle of universal gravitation, is the space-time. Science now had not only a new theory of universal gravitation, but also a more developed idea of how principles shape the curvature of space-time. This idea was subsumed under a general theory of relativity. The theorist and scientist was no other than Albert Einstein. <laughs> Towards the end of the 19th century, the United States of America, the first and only truly sovereign power to ever defeat the British Empire, had been established as a world power through the transcontinental railroad and its newly founded industrial might. The scientific power and creative might that the American system represented was exhibited for the world at the great 1876 centennial celebration. American advancements in industry, power, production, art, and new scientific research were put on display as a testament to the commitment to progress and creativity this American system represented. The influence of the American system was vast and had reached France, Russia, China, Japan, South America, and Germany. Under this influence, the consolidation of crucial infrastructure projects, such as the Great Trans-Siberian Rail Project, the Berlin to Baghdad Rail Project, and other important treaty agreements, now threatened to outflank Britain's previous maritime trade control over the world. The British reaction was to orchestrate a series of wars and scandals, ultimately culminating in World War One, But the best way to ensure their maritime dominance and monetary control over the world was to destroy science. Scientists across Europe 
instead of laying the blueprints for new sources of power generation, creating the designs for faster rail lines, and developing new cities, were lured away from the type of research that would result in the overall improvement of the conditions of the population of the world, and instead were caught in an environment of political pressure, forced to vector their talents toward producing weaponry for war. The lack of funding, the social discrimination that had become commonplace, and general pessimism made conditions nearly impossible for scientific progress to occur, exactly as the British Empire had intended. During this same period, the scientific community found themselves in the midst of a war of their own, one begun hundreds of years before. Confronted by the intellectual developments of the Renaissance, which was the humanist movement which swept Europe throughout the 14th to 16th centuries, the imperial faction, centered in Venice, recognized both the threat to the empire that creativity represented and the impossibility of trying to stop all technological breakthroughs. Through the wily Venetian agent Paolo Sarpi, who thought it were better to attempt to co-opt discoveries in order to lie about how they were made, Venice managed to thus obscure the creative process itself. In this tradition, Sir Isaac Newton was created and hailed as the premier scientific genius of the world. Although, as the scientific community would soon come to realize, he was an ignorant fraud, whose absurd conceptions of space and time served only to halt scientific progress. Absolute space, by its very nature and regardless of anything else, remains always immobile and immutable. Absolute, true, and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without regard to anything external and by another name is called duration. What kind of a universe does this Newtonian notion of space and time imply? And what are the implications of such a conception for society? Isaac Newton was never really a scientist in the true sense. He was created and promoted by circles around England's Royal Society at the turn of the 18th century in order to destroy science. Actively opposed to Newton was humanist, scientist, and politician Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, the key intellectual author of our own U.S. Constitution. Leibniz was exerting influence across Europe and Asia, organizing governments from Peter the Great's Russia to Austria-Hungary to the House of Hanover in an alliance to break up the political control that Imperial Venice, the British Empire's predecessor, had over England and Europe, and to free the world from Newton's assault on science. One of Leibniz's key missions was to destroy the developing influence that Isaac Newton had over science and to make sure that Newton's faulty conceptions of space and time were not adopted by the society of that day. Leibniz, as many after him, knew that were science to fall into the grasp of Newton's philosophical conceptions, society would find itself in peril. I have many demonstrations to confute the fancy of those who take space to be of substance, or at least an absolute being. But I shall only use at present one demonstration, which the author here gives me occasion to insist upon. I say then, that if space was an absolute being, something would happen for which it would be impossible that there should be a sufficient reason which is against my axiom. And I prove it thus. Suppose space is something absolutely uniform, and without the things placed in it, one point of space absolutely does not differ in any respect whatsoever from another point of space. Now from this it follows, supposing space to be something in itself, besides the order of bodies among themselves, that it is impossible there should be a reason why God, preserving the same situations of bodies among themselves, should have placed them in space after one certain particular manner, 
and not otherwise. Why everything was not placed the quite contrary way, for instance, by changing east into west. But if space is nothing else but this order or relation, and is nothing at all without bodies but the possibility of placing them, then those two states, the one such as it is now, the other, supposed to be the quite contrary way, would not at all differ from one another. Their difference, therefore, is only to be found in our chimerical supposition of the reality of space in itself. But in truth, the one would exactly be the same thing as the other, they being absolutely indiscernible, and consequently there is no room to inquire after a reason for the preference of the one to the other. The case is the same with respect to time. Supposing anyone should ask why God did not create everything a year sooner, and the same person should infer from this that God has done something concerning which it is not possible that there should be a reason why he did it so and not otherwise. The answer is that his inference would be right if time was anything distinct from things existing in time. For it would be impossible that there should be any reason why things should be applied to such particular instance rather than to others, their succession continuing the same. But then the same argument proves that instants, considered without the things, are nothing at all, and that they consist only in the successive order of things. This order remaining the same, one of the two states, namely that of a supposed anticipation, would not at all differ, nor could be discerned from the other, which now is. But then the same argument proves that instants, considered without the things, are nothing at all and that they consist only in the successive order of things. This order remaining the same, one of the two states, namely that of a supposed anticipation, would not at all differ, nor could be discerned from the other, which now is. For Leibniz, Newton's relegation of man to the role of a mere counter and measure of material effects, while lacking the power to act on the universe for the good, left man as a slave, without the power to control his own future. Newton's method masks questions about the physical universe, for example how gravity works, behind numerological magic, which Leibniz properly compared to a medieval occult power. For Leibniz, the idea of space and time is independent, fixed, and absolute, never existed. Rather, it was ideas and principles which could be known and discovered by the mind of man, which created the curvature of a single space-time. Unfortunately, following Leibniz's death, his work was attacked viciously by the British Empire, and Newton's mystical hoax of an entropic universe and an absolute space and time became the new scientific doctrine. But a number of unavoidable paradoxes, including the principle that light took a least action pathway through a given medium, and the experiments which proved that the rate of propagation of light was constant in all reference frames, would soon call into question, for the entire scientific community, Newton's conception of space and time. The man to do it was Albert Einstein. Of this. Imagine you have an observer standing on the embankment of a train station watching a ray of light moving from point A to point B. Now this ray of light is on a train which is moving past him. Now you have a second observer who is on that train watching the same ray of light. They both have stopwatches. And when the light begins to move, they begin their stopwatches. When the light reaches point B, they stop their stopwatches. Will the movement of the train have an effect on the ray of light? 
The observer sees the light move in a diagonal line C, whilst the passenger sees it move in a straight line directly in front of him, D. Meaning that for the observer, the light has traveled a longer distance. According to Newton, absolute space and absolute time are essentially fixed and everything else must be measured accordingly. Therefore, to Newton, the velocity of the train must be added to the velocity of the light. Meaning that the light has to travel faster over a longer distance, yet the time for the man on the embankment and the man on the train is essentially the same. However, though these times may appear to be the same, what is actually happening? Absolute space and time do not exist, and only principles, such as the speed of light itself, remain constant. If the speed of light is unaffected by the velocity of the moving train car, that is, if it remains at 300,000 kilometers per second despite the motion of the car, then wouldn't the observer have to have had measured a different time from that of the passenger? Upon comparison, it is seen that the time of the event for the passenger on the train is shorter than that of the person on the embankment. How is it that given the same event observed, two different times are measured? Space and time are not separate. They are essentially of a single indivisible unit. You cannot have a space or reference frame without a particular time, and you cannot have a time without a particular space. Einstein declared that since not all clocks could be definitively synchronized, then time was not after all absolute, as Newton had believed, but rather relative to the frame of reference of the clock by which it was measured. Similarly, since there existed no definitive empirical method to detect whether an object's motion through space was absolute, Einstein declared that all spatial relations were also relative to a given reference frame chosen. Principles, such as the least action principle of light and the constancy of its speed of propagation, remain valid throughout the universe. It is only principles which make up reality and those principles, like the example of gravitation in our solar system, actually create the space-time we experience. Therefore, space-time, rather than being the box in which phenomena and events occur, become merely the shadows cast by the action of a principle or phenomena.
are familiar with this particular species of animal. They roam among us freely due to their striking resemblance to human beings. But they are rather different. They are environmentalists. Here they are in their natural habitat, where they're most comfortable in a state of confusion and rage. The relevant question for us is, how dangerous is this particular species, and why? The fundamental axiom of environmentalists, like all existentialists, is that man is, at best, just another animal, if not a parasite or virus. And as an animal is bounded by the same environmental and ecological laws as other animals, that is, limited resources, population limits relative to those resources, and survival of the fittest. The only difference being, they say, is that human beings tend to overstep their bounds and threaten to bring down the whole species through overconsumption of limited resources and overpopulation, destroying the remaining life on the planet in the process. A human being, upon hearing this ideology, might ask, well, what's so dangerous about that? Let's investigate how this ideology, this set of axioms and beliefs, shapes the kind of economic space we live in. Given these axioms, the environmentalists would assert that rather than using up our fixed resources on our entire world population today, we must conserve resources in order to extend the time we have to use them. But what's the environmentalist solution once all of our resources are used up? When we've dried up the last of our oil and burned off the last of our coal and natural gas? It's called sustainable renewable energy. That is, the ever reliable wind power, solar power, and biofuels. But is this ideology valid? Are these axioms about our world's resources justified? In fact, just what is a resource? The idea that there are fixed resources is absurd. If you take even a preliminary look at what the history and development of our planet's resource usage has been, the fact is that far from using up scarce resources, human beings create resources. It has always, uniquely, been a discovery by a human being that has made possible the utilization of resources that were previously considered worthless to us, and in some cases, even an inconvenience. What was petroleum? Before it was discovered, it could be burned for fuel. Just some gooey black substance that you hope not to find in your yard. What was coal? before it was discovered that it could be burned to release great quantities of energy and process heat. Just another strata of dirt and rock. The secession of valid scientific hypotheses and discoveries made by the healthy human mind has always been our most valuable resource and the key to our planet's and species' long-term survival. This secession of discoveries has a corollary an upwards progression in the utilization of more energy-dense power sources through the development of technology. In economics, the rate of either increase or decrease of energy flux density, the density of power per cross-sectional unit of area, is one of the only competent indicators of growth in a functioning human society. For example, the shift in human society from a wood-burning society to one burning coal, which is almost four times as energy-dense as wood, yielded not only a quantitative increase in energy, but the higher temperatures and regulation that can be achieved with coal fires permitted the introduction of new technologies, such as smelting of ores, steel making, steam power, and other techniques. The shift to oil, which is about 50% more energy dense than coal, and much lighter and easier to transport, allowed for the creation of faster, more efficient warships and other transport vehicles, and it was much easier to handle, not requiring manual stokers to man the fires on vehicles. 
the shift upwards to even lighter derivatives of petroleum, such as gasoline, benzene, and kerosene, some of the most energy-dense liquids we have today, made transport more efficient. We could fuel and power heavy machinery and create booming industry. Such upshifts in industrial power created the impetus for the building of new cities, improving efficiency of agricultural production, and facilitating transport and trade. The greater density of infrastructure which these shifts facilitated, with rail and telegraph lines connecting major hubs of culture, science, and art, created an environment ripe for the dissemination of ideas. But most importantly, the better quality of life created by these machines allowed the human mind to be freed up for more creative thinking, yielding a greater density in advances in science, culture, and art. The Industrial Revolution, sparked by the shift to a coal and petroleum burning society, created the conditions for yet another upshift in our resource utilization. The discoveries delving into the atomic nucleus, such as the discovery of radiation, yielded the greatest potential increase in energy-dense power yet. A barely visible speck of uranium fuel, when fully fissioned, is equivalent to 1,260 gallons of fuel oil, weighing 4.5 tons, 6.15 tons of coal, or 23.5 tons of dry wood. But more than just a quantitative increase in energy, available through the fission or fusion of atoms, the transformation a shift to a nuclear economy would create is just the beginning of our mastery of the subatomic domain. Whole new fields of science and medicine would be opened up, including the ability to track and cure diseases, to produce new, better quality materials, and to break down any ore or waste product to its constituent elements through the fusion torch. It's been this naturally occurring anti-entropic development of our planet that has characterized our species' history. To deny that is to act against the universe, which itself is typified by such a creative anti-entropic character. From something as large as the evolution of our solar system, which has gone from a spinning disk of hot plasma to a highly organized system of harmonically orbiting planets spinning around a sun, which supports all life on our planet through a process of polarized fusion, to something as seemingly insignificant as the lowly little chlorophyll molecule, which, through a process known as photosynthesis, converts the radiant energy of sunlight, a relatively low energy dense form, along with water and carbon dioxide, into a higher energy flux density, creating carbohydrates and sugars to fuel its own growth, and transforming the whole biosphere by releasing oxygen into the air and creating a more habitable environment for higher forms of life. What the environmentalists and all who deny order in the universe fail to recognize is that the biosphere itself is bounded by a principle of upward development and complexity, and that man uniquely is capable, as a single species and as an individual, to know and act upon that totally bounding principle, to drive the biosphere to even higher levels of development in the course of the development of the noosphere. Any process you look at, though it may seemingly be entropic in the small, is ultimately a part of such a self-developing, creative whole. As Einstein characterized it, looking back at Johannes Kepler's unique discovery of universal gravitation, we are living in a universe which is finite but unbounded. Such a conception is the only true metric we can have for that which we call space-time and must become our new metric in society. The universe as a whole, including the lower living biotic and non-living abiotic domains, is organized and bounded anti-entropically by human creativity. In other words, 
there is a natural process of development that the universe tends towards, and it absolutely depends on human beings for its continued development. Human creative thought is vital to that process. One might say that the universe was created not only with us in mind, but also for us. I pass over in silence the fact that this very matter of creation, which the philosophers have denied, is a strong argument when we perceive how God, like one of our own architects, approached the task of constructing the universe with order and pattern, and laid out the individual parts accordingly, as if it were not art which imitated nature, but God himself had looked to the mode of building of man who was to be. بننظفها غرفة المدير بس الصفوف تاعتنا كيف بدنا نقرا فيها؟ الطاولات مهقشة، الكراسي مهقشة، اللوحة حتى في حاله مهقش، الشبابيك مهقشة، البوايض مهقشة، حتى في الصف بحاله مهقش، كيف كيف احنا بدنا ندرس عاد فيه؟ طب يعني بدناش احنا البنوك، بدناش اياهم، بس احنا بس بدنا نوقف وقف، بس بدنا نوقف وقف، نجي على اللوح وبس We currently have over 6.7 billion people on this planet, yet we still have not made the shift toward the next phase and energy flux density required to comfortably sustain an increasing global population, namely, a nuclear economy. How have the ideas and axioms that govern this society, that of an absolute space and time, broken today's world? What kind of space-time have we created? As a result of this current economic policy, which again is premised on a Newtonian view of science, we've denied food, education, technology, and the right to develop, not only to the third world, but increasingly to the developed sector as well. Instead, we've practiced a deliberate policy of genocide. Under the doctrine of fixed resources, we have sought to loot resource-rich nations, such as those in Africa and Russia, intentionally leaving nothing for the consumption or development of their populations. Under this doctrine, we have created whole nations of slaves keeping people in desperate conditions because we don't have the political will to develop them. Rather than making scientific breakthroughs and moving to higher energy flux-dense power sources, we have used human beings whose greatest resource is the creative powers of the human mind and relegated them to nothing more than cheap animal labor, mere products of the biosphere. With the current push for green or renewable energy sources, we have taken the natural progression towards more energy flux-dense power sources, which has taken human society hundreds of years to develop, and in an instant, gone back to the Stone Ages.
Now there are those who would say that this action halts progress and stagnates development, essentially wasting time. They would be wrong. What is actually happening is that a reversal of time is taking place. Since time is, as we are coming to discover, nothing more than a measure of change, we are actually moving backward. We've clearly identified how the abiotic and biotic are increasingly coming under the influence and control of the noosphere, and how that has defined and characterized society and the planet as a whole. This process has a directionality to it and an anti-entropic character. Our current society is organized in such a way that it destroys humanity's power to willfully organize and develop the abiotic and biotic domains and instead degrades us to a state of mere animals or, worse, biotic machines. In such a society, we experience a true reversal of time. So we see that in all of these processes, you are reversing time because you are actually moving backwards against the natural anti-entropic development of the planet. It's these policies promoted and practiced today that are responsible for the problems we face in our society. It's these policies that are being practiced and are being pushed for that are responsible for the problems that we face today. It is the belief in imaginary concepts such as absolute space and absolute time, entropy, which lead to the belief in absurd ideas such as limited resources, supply and demand, or global warming, and which ultimately cause us to accept the atrocious conditions we have in our global community today. A demoralized, ignorant, dying population starved physically, mentally, and also spiritually. The fact is that the scientific culture that we adapt to or accept not only supplies us with the stuff we believe, it also organizes the way we think about everything. It's space-time now to reject pseudoscience. It's space-time to reject a population which has become too little to see what the ideas and conceptions are that will actually change society for the better. It's space-time to reject administrations that don't understand real science and therefore don't understand this country and what its role in the future of this planet and human civilization must be. It is never the quantity of people, the number of governments, or the amount of money which causes a revolutionary change in society or anywhere in the universe. It is the ideas and conceptions that govern society, that originate from and are located in a creative individual, that cause the great changes and create the space-time worth living in. We do not ask what hope of gain makes the little bird warble, since we know that it takes delight in singing, because it was for that very singing that the bird was made. So, there is no need to ask why the human mind undertakes such toil in seeking out the secrets of the heavens. For the reason why the mind was joined to the scenes by our Maker is not only that man should maintain himself, which many species of living things can do far more cleverly with aid of even an irrational mind, but also so that from those things which we perceive with our eyes to exist, 
we should strive toward the causes of their being and becoming, although we should get nothing else from them. And just as other animals and the human body are sustained by food and drink, so the very spirit of man, which is something distinct, is increased and in a sense grows up on this diet of knowledge, and is more like the dead than the living, if it is touched by no desire for these things. Therefore, by providence of nature, nourishment is never lacking for living things, and treasure so well concealed in the fabric of the heavens is so that fresh nourishment should never be lacking for the human mind, and it should never disdain it as stale, nor be inactive, but would have in this universe an inexhaustible workshop in which to busy itself. What do you think the moon is? Um, it's rocks. That's what I created in school. Crater, crater, I think it's made like of cheese. Bowls. I like cheese. Milk. It's made of cheese and milk. You're six. 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 You're then the sun's light, it, the sun's light pushed, the sun's rays pushed onto Mars, then it, then it made all the rivers turn into sand. I will not allow gangsters on my planet because they will kill people. Para que la gente vaya y exista la luna de queso. Déjese, déjese ahí. No, me quiero sentar. Para muy bajita. que exista la luna de queso y para que la gente vaya a comer queso en la luna. ¿La luna de queso? ¿Seguro? ¿Para eso es? Ay, no. ¿Pero la luna es de queso? Hola, yo soy Candela Sofía, me llamo Rubén Santiago. No, 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 no me payasada. A ver, yo te quiero, yo te estoy entrevistando, pero de en serio. A ver qué piensa Candela. Sí, dale, papito. Eh, ¿La luna es de queso? Ah, Hay dos lunas. ¿Dos lunas? ¿Cómo dos lunas? Ah, China. Vaya, es coche, Vaya. How long do you think it would take to get to the moon? 